couple things. So David's visiting us today. Uh, so David, I just want to introduce a little, I, I'm not sure where to start. Uh, David has a huge career in system sciences. Worked for IBM for years. Um, he's working, you know, working on, on PhD material with, uh, with uh, in Finland. He's part of the systems group, the systems thinking groups. He's kind of helped us in many ways on, on uh, all aspects of systems. He's kind of really knowledgeable. You can kind of search out some of his material on LinkedIn He's, and Wikipedia. He's actually got a lot of services from science material there. There's lots of articles. We asked him to come in today and talk. Uh, one of the areas that he really brings together is uh, service systems and organizational kind of systems from that point of view in system sciences. So it'll be, that's kind of what we asked him to talk about. And I'm sure you'll have lots of questions as he goes through. But uh, I don't know what else to say. Like there's just, it's so extensive. I don't know where to start. <laughs> but uh, you will see, as, as you go through the material, if you have spe specific questions, you'll see that there'll be lots of uh, places. Um, I will post, I think it's already up, I'm not sure. We posted it, it should be under this module for today, so you can follow along um, with this uh, slide uh, presentation. And I'm sure you'll want to give them a lot more information about your life, okay. your life journey. <laughs> um, I'm just going to get some markers. Okay, thanks. Start. If you kill the lights. Yeah. Oh, I'll kill the lights if we Did you just need dry erase? Uh, yeah. Oh, just carry it. Wow, what a resourceful class. <laughs> I told you this class is really impressive. <laughs> With the eraser. Now, that's really, really impressive. <laughs> Just in case I have to write something. Um, so um, the, the slide deck you have is missing one slide. Um, and so comevolving.com slash commons slash publications. Can you say that again? I'm just I don't Coevolving.com slash commons, slash publications, where I keep all my content. Thank you. And uh, I'm also on um, Twitter, at David Ng, if you want to know where I am. That's easy to find. So, um, it's, it's always a great opportunity for me to come and, uh, and speak to classes. And uh, Jeremy was talking about how much I have on the web. Um, and uh, I was saying that the, the reason that I can actually do research is I don't have any teaching. Um, so, <laughs> which, uh, which uh, is, is a really interesting uh, thing. So, what you actually see on the uh, on the web page, and I've recorded, I record these talks, I put them on YouTube and, and things like that, is because when I come to classes, uh, actually present what I'm working on at that point. So, um, if you had come to this class, like I didn't lecture last year, but a uh, year before that, like three years, I lectured. And I was presenting content that I had first presented at the Related System Thinking and Design class, uh, which was about what systems thinkers, what, what designers should know about systems thinking. Um, and so since then, I've been working on my PhD. This is the, uh, people, people complain about how long it takes to get to grad school. And uh, uh, I started at Alton University in Finland in 2003. Uh, I was visiting with a friend, and uh, he, he was teaching a class in Finland, and I went to help him. Uh, they asked if I wanted to teach in Finland, and I said, oh, that'd be great. Um, and my friend said, well, you might as well finish your PhD while you're here. And so I applied to became this PhD student in Finland, and um, it was a very strange PhD because uh, I got called in by a uh, director of grad studies, and he said, uh, we know you're not progressing on your PhD very quickly, and I said, yeah, well, I'm not in a real hurry because, you know, I do have a full-time job at IBM and my goal is to finish my PhD before I retire. And he says, you know, we can, you know, in Finland we can get you student funding. And I said, I doubt your funding is better than I do salary. <laughs> and he said, good, take your time. It's fine. <laughs> so, uh, and, but I, I, uh, did my, I was in the PhD program the first time between 1982 and 1984 at University of British Columbia. Um, for those of you who are up on your reading and have read um, Michael Lewis's The Undoing Project about Danny Kahneman and, and uh, Amos Tversky, 
there's a section where they talk about um, Kahneman being at UBC and Tversky flying up every other weekend. I was part of that period. And so I had a class with Danny Kahneman. So for people who are complaining about how long it takes to a PhD, I started my PhD in 1982. <laughs> <laughs> so the result is I've had this um, career where I've always been uh, part of half in the field and half in academia. Um, and so um, uh, uh, I started at IBM in 1985, and I started off doing econometrics at IBM, um, economic headquarters. Uh, I had this joke at, uh, at IBM. I, I, my plan was, and my actual career route, I started at the top of the company, and I worked my way all the way down. And when I got to the bottom, they threw me out. Because uh, at that point, I was doing uh, technical sales in the field. Um, but the, uh, in, in around 1990, I uh, helped found a research center at the University of Toronto called the Canadian Center for Marketing and Information Technologies. And this is when Supermarket Scanner was first coming up. So at that point, as I was telling Jeremy, uh, we had this whole field of marketing science. And marketing science was the, the challenge when they had all the supermarket scanner data. We had people that, one, understood marketing, two, understood statistics, and three, nothing about computers. And now we have this field called data science. And data science is, one, people that understand marketing, two, understand computers, and three, understand nothing about statistics. So now it's like I'm teaching statistics, so in a couple of weeks I'm going to China. It's like teaching statistics, like, I did this in 1985. Like, it's kind of like picking up the ground. So um, this talk, um, and, I, and, I, and it'll be interesting comparing what I do today versus what I do yesterday, because the slides are the same, but the content wandered all over the place. Um, so the question that, that I've asked myself is, okay, so you are a design student, you're a master of design, and what does he know about system thinking? And in, in the research I'm doing now, it's um, service system thinking, and I'll explain what that actually means. And um, what happened in the other talk I used to give were I give theoretical sorts of snippets about what it is in systems thinking that is not in other fields because system thinking is really interdisciplinary. It's designed to be interdisciplinary and actually what upsets me when I may or may not go to the ISSS meeting this year is when people take systems thinking and they make it a discipline. Because as soon as you make it a discipline, it loses its value. But the world wants us to be disciplinary, so we end up having to be what um, popular called T-shaped people. You have to be deep in one field, you have to be broad across the others. When you have that crossbar in the T, how is it that you actually get that breadth and maintain a depth? And the challenge you have there is the communication across all of those disciplines. So um, the, the, I, I fell into systems around um, 1999. There's a book called Adaptive Enterprise by Steve Peckle. And I was assigned at that point at IBM to go and work with Steve as he was writing that book. Um, and um, the, the promise uh, we actually had is uh, so the Advanced Business Institute at IBM was a place where uh, IBM would give free education to executives. And the joke was, if you were a CFO that became a CIO, this is where you went to learn to push a mouse. Because <laughs> at that point, like, a mouse was new, and people weren't doing PC and stuff like that. So, uh, but that's what it was. And so Steve Heckel, um, when he was forming the book, he when it came up with all these assertions. Uh, some of the assertions were like, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, purpose, the, the primary constituent for an enterprise is its customers not its shareholders. And they go, okay, Steve, I did an MBA, you know, and all kind of, you know, Milton Friedman, you know, shareholders are, you know, driving, go, no, no, no. And he made these same assertions with such certainty. It's like, well, how does he know this stuff? So that's when he went, that's when he said, you need to go read some Russ Acoff. And Russ Acoff, you've been reading um, John Sheen, George Doggy's work. John Sheen worked with Russ Acoff. So that's the, the, the tie. I do a lot of history of science because all these people kind of tie in together, and that's how the ideas flow. So um, when Steve, after I started going to conferences, I fell into the systems community um, and uh, had the single best educational experience of my life within the systems community. Uh, Steve Heckel came back and he said, uh, he, 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 the conference kind of like this. So Steve's like this, and at this point it's kind of like, oh, this is how the book should go. And I said, 
I said, uh, uh, Steve, I don't understand this part because you say this, but Russ Acoff says this. And at which point he said, I told you to go read Russ Acoff, not become Russ Acoff. <laughs> um, so the thing I'll warn you about the, uh, the readings that you've done, and I've seen the readings that uh, and kind of have a sense of what you've been doing. Um, Russ Acoff and those ideas are not all system thinking. The reason that Russ Acoff is very, very good for people who are getting into system thinking is because he is extremely clear. Um, my friend David Hawk, who I mentioned multiple times in his talk, uh, was Russ Acoff's first PhD student, and said that Russ wrote the same book 23 times. So, um, and you know, the, you get kind of crusty after you don't get your message, but it's, it's actually somewhat true that he's written it that way. Um, but what happens in generally, if, if we have enough time, and you'll, you'll find this in my talk, is I spend half of the time building you up to Russ Acoff and you getting the ideas. And then I spend the other half of the talk tearing down Russ Acoff and saying, well, okay, you learned all this stuff, now you understand all that? Great, you understand that? Okay, now what if it isn't true? What if it's another way of looking at the world? So this talk had actually gone a lot farther on that uh, because of a couple of things that were going on. Uh, one, I've been working on a PhD, and so I'm actually in the last, last, last part of my last chapter, I've had to explain a lot of stuff. Um, so for those of you who, um, you, you hear the, 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 uh, the name Gregory Bateson, I've moved from being an ACOF guy to being a Bateson guy, which the systems community is like, really? It's a big jump. Um, and uh, the other part is that in trying to get practical, and this isn't in my dissertation, I've been working a lot on a generative pattern language, and so the final paper for that uh, I presented in October. Um, and this is, in, uh, this is work that's in an architecture community. So I was presenting at the Pearl Conference, um, and uh, I met some of the original people that have been doing work since the 1970s. And so um, uh, it took me three years to get enough um, uh, gumption, I guess, or background to do that, because I was standing at the uh, Pattern of the Plot Conference, which is a computer science conference, presented at a Purposaw Conference, which is a social change conference, that had similar content and finalizing it in uh, pattern language. So what I want you to do and think about and, and what you're doing in your um, work, your thesis work, is I want you to think about reflecting on the acts of representation. And what do I mean by that? Let's take that apart. So when I, when I talk about representation, I'm talking about what you're presenting to other people and the way you're presenting to other people. Now, in order for you to present to other people and commit that act, What's going to happen is that you start bringing your biases, your point of view, into the way that other people hear what you're talking about. So, a representation. Russ Acoff's representation of the world. If I come in, I cite Acoff, and people who know and have read Acoff, I go, oh, okay, I know that. And then someone says, what am I doing this way? And I go, well, that's actually someone else's model. So Bateson looks at the world this way, Acoff looks at it this way, and I, just, I know Bateson, but right now we're in Acoff's camp. So for me, a lot, of, uh, a lot of system is history of science because there are so many different streams. Um, I, I forgot to mention yesterday, in the last class, but uh, Peter brought it up. There's a group here called System Thinking Ontario. Uh, we meet in the Lambert Lounge every third Wednesday of the month. System Thinking Ontario is a spin-off from the International Society of System Sciences because Toronto is a system thinking hub and people don't really think about that. Um, I'll give you the, 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 the best example who is Elena Leonard. Elena Leonard was president of the International Society of System Sciences. She was the president of the American Society for Cybernetics. The Cybernetics of different community and system community. Plus she was Stafford Beer's life partner and lives up in the end. And the reason we started System Thinking Ontario, um, Peter was running um, Design and Dialogue, but we started System Thinking Ontario because Elena and I would never meet in Toronto. I would see Elena in Vienna, uh, I'd see her in Tokyo, I'd see her all around the world, and we'd never see each other in Toronto. I was like, yeah, there's something wrong here. So we started this program where we just have a meeting every month, and the topic changes, doesn't matter, we don't all show up at the same time. Uh, but even at York University, the, the, the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University, people don't understand that is one of the world's leading uh, places for system sciences. 
because when you're talking environmental studies, it's system and environment. It's not environmental science, it's environmental studies. But people don't appreciate that. So we've got York University uptown. We've got this program, um, which is you know, right around Peter's work, our latest thing in design. And at U of T, we've also got work with Steve Easterbrook. And the people will talk to each other. We, you know, we go off to Vienna, we meet in Vienna, we never meet here. So, so trying to bring these groups together, uh, we, we have all these different points of view. Now, Elena is someone I respect a lot, and she respects me. We come from like really, really different points of view in the system community. So when, when someone says, I've been a staff at Bureau Pro, it's kind of like, okay, Bible systems models, integrations, integrations, integrations you know, all this methods, all this sort of stuff. And it's a way of approaching it. And if you have a problem where you want to work on something, I find um, that work works work really well in diagnosis. The Bible systems model is great for diagnosis. It's not so great, I find, for prescription normally stuff. Right? So when we're talking here about reflecting, what I'm doing now is reflecting to you what I'm representing. I'm saying that, OK, this is currently David Ng's view of what system thinking is, and paper services thinking. It is not the only view of the world. Um, and your view will change a little bit and shift with that. So I'm going to cover um, five topics. Um, and I'm already like way off from what I did yesterday. Um, and we're, we're probably going to get through four of them. So I didn't have this long preamble yesterday. We got through four of them. But I want you to, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to get through this, uh, these ideas. So the first one, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a little hint here. And this is a, a little thing. Is um, Since I do have this background, I'm not a computer scientist, but I've spent my whole career around computer science people. Um, representation is really important to me. So when you see that little thing in the middle, some of those are singles, headed arrows, and some are double headed arrows. And that's a very, very subtle sort of thing that someone will look at and they well, mostly won't pay attention to it, but it's kind of like, no, I mean it. And they kind of go, well, what's that mean? Well, okay, let's talk about that. So let's first talk about architecting and designing. What's the difference between architecting and designing? Why aren't you guys in an architecture program? <laughs> so you want to be an architecture program, but this is what you made, yeah. So what kind of architecture do you mean? Um, buildings or computer architecture? Good question. Because I'm an enterprise architect, like computers, but not okay. buildings. Great. Since I'm a business architect at IBM, the question is, is business architecture a sub-discipline of enterprise architecture, or is enterprise architecture a sub-discipline of business architecture? Uh, usually it's arranged so that the business Architecture is under the under, yes, exactly. That just makes the way, right way to do it. It's just the way you usually answer. Yeah, I know, I know. But I spent a whole career with that. And then someone asked, well, doesn't business architecture do what enterprise architecture do? And I say, do you do organization design? You go, no. OK, well, I do organization design. So, so but that, that's a great example, because what's happened is these ideas of architecture have, have permeated across fields. So in computers, we have architecture. And people talk about this sort of thing every day. But what I'm going to do is present a slightly different view on that, which is this idea that goes back to 1969 in the architecture community. And so in architecture, they had this distinction between problem seeking and problem solving. Architectural programming, architecture, in essence was problem seeking. Design was problem solving. Okay. So if you start reading a lot of architecture, everyone's going to run across these really weird architects who only do really bizarre projects. Like they want to build a building on the side of a mountain that won't fall off. And people go, you're crazy to do that. And what they're doing is that they're seeking a problem that's sufficiently hard to make it worth doing. Okay. So when you are doing your presentation and when you're doing your analysis work on your projects, the question is, should you actually be focused on the problem seeking or the problem solving? If you're focused on problem seeking, there, there are lots of problems in the world. And, and you'll see very soon I'm going to have a problem with the word problem. But there are a lot of problems in the world, and you can't solve all of them. So if you are architecting, is it possible to separate that part out, or is it part of the same thing? So, 
archi all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. If you want that quote, that's like from Brady Hooch, so that's good, for people who are computer science. So, so the way that I would frame this is architectural thinking is shaping the structure of the environment. That's one way of looking at it. Now, design thinking, since that's a new term, um, you can go with the, the standard idea sort of thing, but idea of divergent steps, creating choices, and convergent steps, making choices. Um, let's let's dig, dig a little bit deeper. There are a few people who write about architecture in systems. And so I introduce two ideas to you. One is autopoiesis, and the other is allopoiesis. Now, if anyone has been around knowledge management, you may hear the term autopoiesis, which came from um, Maturana and Morela. Maturana is part of the systems community, the biologist of Chile. And the idea of autopoiesis, poesis is creating or making. Auto means self-making, right? So living systems are autopoetic, which means they're self-organizing and self-generating. Human beings, your, your, your human body creates its cells, and it generates, so it reorganizes itself automatically, it regenerates, and that's where, uh, that's where Maturana started. It will also apply, we talk about living systems, to uh, social systems, we can extend into that, that people are in effect self-organizing and self-generating. You can compare that to assembly lines that are allopoetic, and an assembly line has like packages coming off the end, you're building a car, the car comes off, the car looks nothing like the assembly line. So you're designing an allopoetic system that is externally organized and externally generated. Now we could talk about an era where robots actually create more robots like themselves, which would make it autopoetic. But when we talk about living things, we end up with this distinction about whether it's living or non-living. So living systems, here's a pretty rigorous definition. Now if you are, in design thinking. Are you in the phase where you can actually make the distinction that you're going to have something that's either allopoetic or autopoetic? Or are you outside of that? So one of the examples I have, my, my friend David Hawk, doing his PhD under Brush Aikoff in the 1970s, was working on the problem of environmental regulation. This is in the days, early days of EPA when it started coming into power. And what he was looking at was can you design a governance system that is self-governing, self-maintaining? Because the way that most laws are built is they come in and they're really allopoetic. It's like, we have this law, don't do this. And it's like, how do you enforce that? Okay, so we have the travel ban coming in from Trump and he announces it over a weekend, right? It's like, everyone's scrambling. It's like, how do we do this? Can you create something that is self-reinforcing? So David was instrumental in what became the Energy Star program. A simple discussion, discussion of the uh, description of the, Ener of the Energy Star program is you have a refrigerator, you walk through the refrigerator, on the refrigerator there's a sticker that says this refrigerator uses this much power and over this many years it's going to cost you this much electricity. Beside it there's another refrigerator and the other refrigerator, hey this refrigerator is $100 cheaper. But you know, I, I can look at these two stickers and it's like, it's $100 cheaper, but in two years, the refrigerator is going to be better by. That is an example of a self-enforcing, self-reinforcing system. It did not require government regulation to do that. The Energy Star program came out of the Manufacturers Association, and so they enforced it themselves. So can we create systems that are self-generating, self-reinforcing, that is an architectural issue much more than it is a design issue. So after you've got it, it's kind of like, okay, how are we going to you know, make sure these people are actually um, posting the correct uh, statistics on power use, that sort of stuff. That's sort of to be a design work. But architecture work takes you a next step up. How many of you have heard of Stuart Brand's How Buildings Learn? Okay, there, here's your homework. Go to YouTube, there is um, How Buildings Learn, a six-part BBC series. And 
the, the origins of this is Stuart Brand, um, he, he, he leads a foundation now called the Long Now Foundation, which was uh, started with Brian Eno and other people. Um, but his, his background goes back into uh, Ken Kesey and the Mary Frank series, all sorts of stuff. Um, so uh, he, the, the, the question was really asked, this is written in the period around organizational learning and knowledge management. And what he wanted to study was knowledge. But knowledge is abstract, and there's not a lot of history on it. If you actually want to study something, he said, well, let's do this. Let's study buildings. And, yeah, and so he, he did this work called How Buildings Learn. Now, when you talk about that, it's a little bit strange, because what does it mean by building and learning? So the usual way we think about buildings is we have the people, and we have the building around the, the people who inhabit it, right? That's a conventional way of thinking about it. But when you're a system thinking, you can avert that because learning is adaptation to an environment. So as opposed to saying that people are the system and the building is the environment, what happens if we look instead at if the building is a system and the people are the environment? Okay. We start off with this bottom, the site. The site is the slowest changing part of a system. It's really hard to move a site. And if you actually want, you know, very rarely, it's always big news, when someone takes a whole building and moves the whole building, puts it on a jack and a truck and drives somewhere else, because site is so difficult. The second thing that comes is structure. Structure is load-bearing walls. Inside the structure, sorry, outside the structure, you then work on the skin, which is to protect the structure. The only place that, uh, the, that really does this backwards is the Pompidou Center in Paris. If you've been there, and they have all the plumbing and ducting on the outside, it's a really bad idea because the, uh, you get corrosion in the ductwork. And then you have to fix that, and so you end up, you know, end up having to put a skin, a second skin, outside your structure and your services. So inside the structure, you have services. This is the venting, uh, electrical, plumbing, all that sort of stuff. And that goes in after you put in the structure because you end up having to mount, go, you know, mount electrical fixtures against the stud, that sort of stuff. You have the space plan. Space plan is non-load-bearing walls. You can decide about that, but you can't decide about putting in non-load-bearing walls until you put in the plumbing because it's a load-bearing, not load-bearing, go through that or not. Space plan, the sort of thing you do is you kind of go, you look at this wall and you go, we need a bigger room. Can we go through that wall? It's like, well, is there, first thing, is there any venting going through there? Is there plumbing going through there? If there's plumbing going through there, and you have to move the plumbing, it's gonna be a lot of work. So the last thing is stuff, which is furniture, mobilia. Mobilia because it's stuff that moves. So the difference between a closet and an armoire, because they both are clothes, a closet, when you move, you can't take it with you. It's part of the space plan. And if you're changing places and put down enough closets to get a buy an armoire, you can take that with you, you may or may not use it. So you make all these sorts of things. Now these, these, these make these decisions. Now the reason that this is an interesting way of looking at buildings is that it has this mixture between structure and process. Because um, you can actually see how layers change over time. So originally this was called a shearing layers approach. He since adapted it, now it's called a pacing layers approach. Um, but this is helpful in thinking through, when you're architecting stuff, do you move stuff from one layer to another layer? Okay, I'm gonna talk about now a little bit about service systems. Um, because a lot of what you've been thinking about and looking at are production systems. And it's a very fine distinction that people miss quite often. So the, the advent of, of this, the, serving this um, idea of service systems came around 2003, and Jim Sporer, who at that point was a, uh, a researcher at IBM Olin, um, uh, was given an interesting opportunity challenge. Uh, so those of you who ever tracked the history of IBM, IBM used to be a hardware company, and then became a software services company, and then it's like, oh, at one point it's like IBM, if you look at IBM revenue, half of IBM's revenue is coming from services. OK, 
okay, that's interesting. So they go over to IBM Research and go, you know, um, you guys are research. So if half of our revenue is coming from services, how much are we spending in research and services? And it's like, uh, yeah, it's like we do disk drives, we do hardware, you know, all this physics stuff. We move atoms around. It's like, so IBM Research was spending next to nothing on services. And so Jim Sporer, around 2003, said uh, he, started, he started this campaign, he said it would be a 10-year project, to start this field of what he called service science. Because we don't really understand what's going on. And if you look at developed countries, developed countries, 70-80% of the economy is services. In GDP, if you want to count it that way. So what's happening in our economies? Can we using this framing that we are in the old days like machines? So I, the way I like look at this is go a little bit backwards on this, and let's let's think about what what happens in and the different assumptions you get when you work in the right type of system. So we'll go back to agricultural systems. We'll go back before the industrial revolution. Before the industrial revolution. So Jeremy is farming. He's he's doing. Actually, pretty bad farmer. <laughs> so, Jeremy, Jeremy, I have this factory. I have an offer for you, right? Um, why don't you come and you work for me? You work nine to five. Um, it's warm in the winter. Uh, it's uh, it's cool in the summer with air conditioning. I guarantee you pay. You know, no failed crops. You know. So Jeremy says, "Oh, that sounds pretty good." I said, "Okay, you start Monday, nine o'clock." And Jeremy says, you mean sunrise? Uh, no, we work nine to five. But there's this problem. Um, in the summer, you lose all that daylight. And then, you know, we live in the Northern Hemisphere. In the winter, I come to work in the dark and I go home in the dark. Why don't we, you know, flex around and, you know, work more in the summer and less in the winter? No, no, we work nine to five, year round. So we have this built-in mentality that comes in the industrial age, which is developed around machines. And we're working on shifts, and that's the way the world has evolved, and we all recognize it. I'm in mean, class at 8.30, it's like, why 8.30? Why don't we come in class at you know, 1 o'clock afternoon? Why, why do we, we do it this way? So now we have this idea of service systems, and we're a service economy. And so the question I ask is, it is midnight, your primary client phones you on your mobile phone. Do you answer the phone? It's not between nine and five. <laughs> now this is your client that if this guy is dissatisfied, you are out of the job tomorrow. This is a sign of a service economy. So we're always connected, and we're working on this different time schedule. All these presuppositions come in on a certain economy. So uh, one of the things that happened at IBM, the interesting New York Times article, uh, IBM stop counting vacation time. Why would you count vacation time? Or why, why do you have vacation time? We need vacation time because people can't work. They don't want people to work themselves to death, right? So you have vacation time. But when I actually did the studies, it turns out that IBMers were not taking their full vacation anyway. And so it's kind of like, okay, you have your measurement system. So if you're a salesperson, you have a sales target, if you're a development team, they've got their projects laid out, but we'll be up this level, stuff like that. So why is it that you're doing counting hours? Now I was in consulting. Consulting is the worst one of all this. Consulting still bills by the hour. And so anyone who cracks the problem of not billing by the hour when you're consulting, I made this joke when people, people in their master's programs, they want to go to consulting. I said, okay, let me understand this. So you studied, you know, six years in university. Um, before you went to university, you could probably get a job at you know, minimum wage for a thing and being paid by the hour. You go to university, you graduate, you go into consulting, where you get the opportunity of being paid by the hour. It's like, is there something wrong here? So we haven't quite understood this. Um, the, uh, the thing that I would do, um, and I did that, you know, I tell everyone at IBM, is that uh, uh, I would work you know, I actually know how much. When I was a consultant, in consulting to build 40 hours a week, I'd have to work 56. That's just what happens. Because besides building the client, it's all this internal stuff you end up doing up on the outside. And so, so I know that. And so I began scheduling Tuesday afternoons to go for half-price movies with my wife. Because I'm already working more than 40 hours. 
It's like, geez, come on, guys. So why is it that we have to schedule we're working 9 to 5? Why don't you schedule? Like, everyone, why don't you schedule Tuesday afternoon off? Like, there's, you know, there's no reason. Like, why go on Saturday when the theaters are full and they're all busy? Go and take Tuesday afternoon off. That's the way that you need to think about a service economy. Now, service systems, and now you're going, well, what the heck are service systems anyway? Um, Jim Spore was at a, uh, um, a meeting in Washington where he's asked, okay, if we're in a service economy and we had to change our primary school system and our secondary school system, how would we do that? What would it, how would it be different? And so he suggested, well, okay, we can do from concrete to abstract. Uh, we start off with systems that move, store, harvest, and process. So firstly, kindergarten, we change about transportation systems. Kids, you have to get to school, firstly, so it's like some kids walk, some kids take the bus, some kids get driven to work, so it's like we can already teach them how to get to school. Transportation is a basic sort of thing. Grade one, we teach them about water and waste management. When you turn on the tap, it's not like water magically appears. You know, water falls from the sky, it goes to the lakes, it goes to filtration, it gets piped through. There's a system that happens there. Food and global supply chain. Food doesn't just show up in a supermarket magically. It doesn't always come wrapped in plastic. How is it? It comes from a farm, how is it part of the transportation system, it works through, there's all this processing. Energy and energy grid. We plug into the wall, we assume electricity is going to be there. Can a grade four student actually go to, you know, an back generating station and understand this is how electricity is made? Information and communication technology. By grade four, your kids may have a mobile phone. Um, I, I keep on Finland, they think they stand with my birth. Um, but uh, the, the idea that you can talk to a person at a distance, how does that really work? So from there, we go to a second class of systems. Systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction is actually a service system. And people don't think about it. It's one of the world's largest service systems. So people think, well, what is it? You're not manufacturing products. So it's a service system. Take them out to a building site. Banking and finance, anyone that's on, 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 on uh, Bay Street recognizes the service industry. Retail and hospitality, obviously. And we take that for granted, but you know, a hotel, what does it take to actually operate a hotel? Do you really know what happens in a retail environment? So my youngest son, I have four sons. My youngest son is currently, uh, is a co-op student uh, from Ryerson, and he's spending a term at Canadian Tire and Headquarters. And, and it's really interesting because these job postings happen at Ryerson, like happen at the university. They're going, Canadian Tires. Ooh, I want a job at Canadian Tire. I get a job at Google, is it? No. If you don't want a job at Google, you want a job at Canadian Tire. If you go to Canadian Tire, you will understand what it means to run a business. So he's in merchandising. He gives me these stories because he's doing line reviews on GPS devices. Like, he's talking about, you know, talking with Garmin and getting those and putting them in every Canadian Tire store in the country. It's like, he understands business and go, wow, they're learning so much. They're going, oh, for me, no, that's a service industry. Healthcare is really complicated. But people really understand how the health system works. It's, a big, it's one of the biggest things in the Ontario budget, and we really understand how it works. And where it's at, now you get to grade nine, education. Do people really understand how the education system works? What's that really mean? Like, if you've been in school for all this time, it's like being a fish immersed in water. You're in this education system. You really understand what that is doing or doing to you. And the last three, systems that govern that are more, more complicated. The government of cities is actually the most concrete because you can see garbage pick up and these sorts of things. When you get to the regional, state, provincial level, it's a little more abstract, but it's pretty good. By the time you get to the federal level, it's like, no one knows what the federal government does because it's all abstract. There's laws and you know, things outside the country you don't see. So these are all service systems. So here's a skill testing question. For you, everyone in this class, who is not working in a service industry? Okay, if everyone in this, oh, you are working, what do you, what do, you do? I'm sorry, you're working not in the service Working industry. not in the service industry. Yeah, an industrial company. You work in an industrial company. Yeah. Okay, so we have, here's the statistic. We have one person in the room <laughs> who is not working in the service industry. So, what are you studying? Are you studying, you're studying, you're, you're studying stuff that came from the manufacturing mentality. And it's like, oh, okay, so, and, and one of my favorite things is you use this term, and, that, and you're going to use this with caution. When everyone says, we need a mechanism to fix that, 
Hubble's saying, we need an organism to fix that. Right? Here's the definition. It comes from the um, Institute for Manufacturing um, at Cambridge. Um, and I've broken it down into a little word gram so it can kind of follow through. A service system is a dynamic configuration of resources. Those resources are people, technology, organization, and shared information. A service system creates and delivers value. The value is through service, and the value is between a provider and a customer. A service system can be a complex system. There's the term system there. The system has interactions. The interactions are between the provider customer, the customer customer, and the supplier supplier. So that's the rigorous definition, and I like the definition, because you'll find that there are people in the service science community that understand systems. There are a lot of people within the service science community that do not understand systems thinking. And so we end up with this interesting split of trying to pick who you actually cite and who you don't cite. Here is one of the people that we don't understand systems. So Rafael Ramirez, um, he's actually not known for the service stuff, Rafael Ramirez is a professor at Oxford now. Um, his background before that was he was, a, he was a scenario planner at Shell. So those who do scenario planning, so Shell is one of the big stories, one of the people that were there. Before he did that, he was actually uh, a graduate of the social system science program at York University. And if you go through the history, Rafael Ramirez, you like to find articles, he was at York University for kind of his first stint when he was teaching. So he's been around the world. But uh, and I actually, I actually asked, asked Raphael, um, he, I got introduced to him with a friend, so when I, I go to the uh, UK, I stopped by, uh, and uh, I was asking him one day, and I said, um, do you do system thinking in your everyday work? And he says, of course I do. And I said, how? And so he said, the way that you do scenario planning um, is you know, probably two, two matrices, right? How do you pick those dimensions? Those dimensions are designed as a Singarian inquiring system. And he said, you're the only person in the world that can understand what that means. That's in the fifth part of this talk that we're not going to today. But it's in the design of inquiring system. So there are ways of doing scenario planning that are system thinking, but most people understand what that is. And there are, I've said lectures about that on the web. You can try to dig them out. But let's go back to this, this idea. In service systems, in service science, there's um, kind of two camps. If you read about this, there's uh, a, a camp that's called service dominant logic. Service dominant logic is done by uh, Steve Barco, who's in Hawaii, and Bob Blush, who's in Oklahoma. Bob Blush is a whole retailing guy. Uh, Steve was a PhD student who developed this idea of service dominant logic. Um, and he says, there's two ways to do services. Like, I asked him, do you know about the Raptor of Mirror stuff? Of course. He says, yeah, well, why do you? not use his terms. He says, okay, there's, there's two ways of, of doing research. One is you use a term that everyone thinks they understand and you overload it. So you spend your time saying, I'm doing service science. And then people go, what do you mean by services? You spend a lot of time explaining services. The other way of doing it is you create a whole new vocabulary which people don't understand, which is really clear, but then you have trained a new vocabulary. So the case for Raphael Ramirez and the people that worked around him, uh, particularly Richard Norman, uh, was they came up with this idea of what they called an offering. An offering has three dimensions. An offering has physical content, service content, and people content. So we talk about automobiles, you've got the physical car, you've got the services like the warranty that comes with the car, and you've got the people who are people that would help you on a long-term basis, you know, on star, you can phone in, you've got people interacting with that kind of And this created this interesting framework, which is now we're thinking about systems. If you have an offering, is the offering a part of an input to a system or an output to a system? So we have an offering as output, we have this industrial logic, we have a car, the customer value is created through the transaction. So in this case, this is the traditional automobile industry. They make the car, it comes off the end of their factory line, you buy the car, you own it. The transaction is done. What we can do is instead look at shifting this to a service logic where we say, well, actually we're valuing you not in the transaction, but in the long-term relationship. So this service logic says, we'll lease you a car. You don't have to own it, you know, we'll take care of the maintenance and that sort of stuff. And um, if, you, if you work through the logic of that, um, 
if, if they take responsibility, they are in it for the long term. Now, if you actually look at um, automotive companies, automotive companies actually don't make their money off of the automobile. They make the money off the financing. It's actually the same in a lot of other industries. So, so of course, in, in GM, you have General Motors financing. At IBM, IBM Global Finance. IBM Global Finance probably makes more money than, you know, on the money than they do on the computers. So you have a lot of industries that are doing this when they have the service logic. If you're going to transactions, you can also have the offering as input. And so as opposed to doing everything for them, the person that's involved, your customer, has to, has, has to actually engage with the service. In this case, you have offering as input. So an a ATM, a bank machine. What's happened is they've taken something where they actually managed all the money and they gave you cash and stuff like that, and now you go and you punch in the numbers. So if there's a mistake made, whose fault is it? If you had an ATM, it's you punching in the numbers and it's like, okay, I can't remember my password, or, you know, I just did the wrong thing. But it's not like being in front of a teller and saying, you made a mistake, right? Fix it. There's this last category of partnership logic. In this case, an offering as input and this customer value through relationship. Um, and this is an interesting long-term sort of thing on joint ventures and research projects. Yes? Sorry, I'm just confused a little bit between what you mean by output and input. I think I'm just, not, like I just missed understanding. Okay, system has an input and has an output. Okay, so you have a supplier system and you have a customer system. So when you're talking about the car, it comes off General Motors. So it's, you're system. talking about who the, like, when you're talking about input and output, you're talking about like, uh, but then the supplier the, being the supplier, it, like who who is doing the inputting and the outputting, or does could no. that change? So, so you have the, the idea of the offering. So you have the package, which is physical service and people content. So General Motors has an offering. At IBM, it's always interesting when they see start percolating. At IBM, the vocabulary we see announcement letters, they announce offerings because it's always hardware and software and services associated with it. So. The offering is, offerings come, they could be come from the um, customer side, but generally offerings come from the seller side, right? So if you look at a house, a, an offering, a, a house can be an offering, but it's usually not initiated by the customer. Usually you don't go knock on a person's door and say, I want to buy your house, right? No, go away, right? So it usually it's on the seller side that things happen. So we're talking about input and output, but this one is mostly on the seller side. But there's a now this general idea you're talking about, which is the important systems. How do you draw the boundaries of the system? Right? So if it's purely transactional, then you are drawing the boundaries and saying, okay, General Motors is the boundary. When it leave, the car leaves General Motors, that's it. There's nothing else to do with it. But when you start taking the customer relationship perspective, it's like, well, it doesn't really leave the system. When you lease the car, is now a co-production system where the customer is giving money and they're driving the car and GM is doing ongoing maintenance. So now you've redefined the system. That makes sense to me for like this column and this column, where I'm still confused is this column and that this column. column. Yes, yeah. So if, if, can you define the offering as an output or is it an input to someone else's system? So in the case so, so, so let me give you the, the example. Um, so I worked in consulting at IBM, uh, and there was also a research division. And people you get IBM researchers working on a project. Uh, and the, there are two ways to do this. So if I was going to do this as offering as output, as a consultant for IBM, I would engage with you and I say, here's what we're going to do. At the end, you will get this liberal, you get this report, we'll have this content. And then I leave. I can bring a few from IBM research, but now the deal is different. Firstly, I don't guarantee you any results. This is research, this is not a consulting project. So I'm gonna work with you on this new technology, and we're gonna, at the end of the project, I can may develop a product out of it, or may not develop a product. You can have whatever assets we jointly develop, because you contributed to it as much as we contributed to it, but it's like, we're gonna maybe not something we're gonna productize. So now it's an input to you that you can do something with. 
and you go, yeah, we're going to learn from IBM, and then we'll be able to work for our own thing. Or you can say at the end, no, we don't want that. We actually want the output because supporting software on an ongoing basis is such a big pain. I'd rather buy something. Um, there was, I, I, I started consulting, I actually moved back in sales. And it was interesting being at one sales meeting where um, the software guy was, a software sales leader was saying, you know what's a customer relationship? Forget it. I don't want that. IBM wants the money. I'm selling you software. And I want the revenue. I don't care what partnership. You know what partnership means? Partnership means at 9-11, when Air Canada gets grounded, IBM takes a hit. And why is that? It's because IBM is in a partnership with Air Canada. The world's largest account in transportation and travel for IBM is Air Canada. Not Lufthansa, not American Airlines. It is Air Canada because all the people at Air Canada tend to be IBMers. Like, this is a partnership. They do everything. Air Canada doesn't work with anyone else. They only work with IBM. So when 9-11 happened, you don't go up and play. You guys aren't giving us enough revenue. I'm going down with you. And, and you know, airlines come around, that's a long-term sort of thing. And so people that think about partnership logic is kind of like, there's a downside of this. It's not a positive, it's a different model. It's a different architecture when you are doing this. You make a decision. Once you get into it, you can design all the details, but it's a completely different architecture and way of working in the company. Okay, I'm going to introduce this idea of affordances. Now, this feels like a question on people in design school. How many people know what an affordance is or think they know what an affordance is? Okay. I'm going to run through this, and I'm going to run through this in a, in a you know, particular way, and I'm going to link that to the pattern language stuff that I've been doing. So there's this book called A Pattern Language in 1975. If you meet any architecture student who doesn't know what it is, then they're really up the rocker. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's in every library in the world. You can go across all the library, it's there. The OCAD library should have a pattern language. Uh, if it doesn't, then they should be shot. Uh, but uh, this, the, the idea that came out in uh, the 1970s, there's this um, architect builder named Christopher Alexander. And Christopher Alexander created this idea of a pattern language because the question was, how do you design a good house. And the, the pattern language has the uh, subtitle Towns, Buildings, and Construction. So how is he designing what he called living buildings? You know, buildings that are nice to be in. So we're having a discussion, uh, just talking about this class. You guys are in this classroom, the upstairs classroom, uh, 510. This is like a nicer room. Why is it nicer? You know, how is it that you actually design it that's different? And so he has these patterns. Now one of the patterns he has in the book as an example is light on two sides. If you have a room, it's a good idea to have light on two sides. If windows on two sides, people love corners, right? It's so much better. Well, why is it that you have light on two sides is better than light on one side? What is a balcony? You know, a balcony is something that is like kind of deep so you can go out, but not so deep that it's part of a big structure. Um, all these sorts of patterns in that people recognize. Uh, so the, the book, A Pattern Language, has the pattern. A Timeless Way of Building has the processes to do that. So people in software, uh, the Timeless Way of Building is at the foundation of a lot of stuff that came into agile development. Um, and, and all the stuff that was working around um, computer science in the 1980s, A Pattern Language is a book in computer science called Design Patterns of Reusable Software. Um, IBM Research, John City is one of the people that did that. And then um, actually just working on user interface stuff uh, and uh, there's this new software called Pattern Lab for designing user stuff. I was at the Google meeting and I talked about Pattern Lab, so obviously oh, using using patterns and using this idea that comes from Christopher Alexander. The third book, uh, Our Oregon Experiment, is about the design of the University of Oregon campus. How do you design a campus that's a nice campus, you know, living, people want to go there? So most people um, will recognize a pattern language book, and in the last class someone said, I have it sitting on the floor, it's on my bed, you know, that sort of thing happens. Uh, the Timeless Way of Building is less famous. Um, no, almost no one has an Oregon experiment, but here's my advice, if you're interested in this stuff at all, don't read any of those. Read this book, which is a more recent book, it's his last book, um, and it has a gutsy title, The Battle for Life and Beauty of the Earth. 
So now he's really venting his old guy. Uh, it's a story of 1985 of him going into Japan and building a school. It's, in, uh, it's out north of uh, Tokyo. It's in um, Aishin School. Um, and um, how is it you divide, uh, design a, a, a joint high school college? That was the plan. Start off with a story about, they start off with tea fields, and they're out there and they're trying to do stuff. And uh, he has all these conventions like, no blueprints. How do you design a whole university campus with no blueprints? And why would you do that? And the reason is that you, blueprints are an fraction. They are a representation. When people develop blueprints, then it's like all of a sudden you've lost all the stuff about the land. And so he goes into um, Aishan, uh, yeah, on these tea fields, and the way he would normally do things would be like put a rock and say, okay, we're going to have this walkway, it's going to arc this way. And then you go on the land and you stand there and you go, no, we need to move it over like that much. <laughs> Trying to do that on blueprints, it's like, no, you can't do that. So you're actually developing stuff on the land. Now, for those of you who are familiar with thought, agile software development, agile software development doesn't do specifications. They do user stories. User stories, and then you go build stuff, and you come back in like, no, you, you have iterations where you come back with the client every two to three weeks. You have a sprint. That is taking the idea of Christopher Alexander and saying, do not write specifications. Do not write requirements. Do it on the land. So if you're doing it in software, you want the user to see it, the user goes, the usual answer is, that's exactly what I told you to build me, and that's not what I want. Because now I see it, I see it on the land, and this path is curved, it's like, no, it's ugly. Move it this way, this much you make a big difference. It also has a story of him uh, grappling with things like importing redwood timber into, from California into Japan without <coughs> having to, um, uh, work through the system that would have inflated all the prices, and then also being able to with the Yakuza because the construction industry in Japan is um, embedded, let's put it that way. So here's a definition of, um, the, of a pattern. A pattern is a recurring structural configuration that solves a problem in a context contributing to the wholeness of some whole or system that reflects some aesthetic or cultural value. Um, you'll find actually if you dig in my blog, blog, I wrote a long time ago, the stuff that I, I write in my blog is painful. Um, I write stuff because, uh, because when I'm grappling with stuff and I, I need to write, but it's not worth an article, I put it on my blog. And so one of the things was, was Christopher Alexander, a system thinker. And yes, absolutely, when you look at the beginning, beginning of his career, Christopher Alexander was a system thinker. He has an article called Systems Generating Systems. The idea was a pattern language would generate a system on which you construct a place. Okay. So um, this is a definition that actually comes from a Jim Copley, and so we're now in computer science uh, doing this. And he says, okay, here's the canonical form for a pattern. You have the pattern name, you have a problem, which is a specific problem to be solved, you have a context around that problem, you have the resulting complex after you've done uh, resulting context after you apply the solution, the solution is impacted by all these forces. So when you're talking about forces, forces are, well, you've got the economics of this. The economics say that you can't go above this amount of money. Well, you start negotiating with, are you really hard and fast about that or not? Um, you, have, uh, you have physical constraints. You can't build a two-story building unless you put these foundations in underneath your four-story or whatever. It has to be built. So there are all these sort of considerations that happen in architecting, not so much design, in architecting the system. You have the rationale explaining all of the why you're doing this, and you have related patterns because when you're talking about pattern, it's related to other things. So my, one of my favorite patterns for Mr. Alexander is an alcove. If you design a long hallway, which is really great, what's going to happen? Well, it has to be a certain width. But when you have that hallway, people tend to walk that hallway, and then they meet each other, and then you've got now a roadblock in the middle of your hallway. So what you do is you design an alcove, and people step out and go, oh, come over here for a second. And you get out of half the people, and you have a private conversation. There's an alcove. 
You can't have the alcove unless you have a corridor. If you have a, cor if you have a corridor, you should have an alcove. So therefore, you've got a linkage between these sorts of things. Having a balcony, you know, balcony you have to have on the outside will require, you know, on the inside, the structures are going to pull it back so it doesn't fall over, or can't leave the structure. These sorts of things. We've got all sorts of things all linked together. Now, I'm going to introduce to you the idea of an affordance. Um, and I want you to think not about so much about the structure, because the structure, um, and, and um, Peter emailed me this with an email back, which I told him, um, <coughs> affordance is, is a term that requires a little bit of unpacking. Uh, and there's a little bit of an error for someone in the field who's pretty big, who is Don Norman. Don Norman was a uh, um, Apple Fellow, he came in, did user interface design. So the trash can on a Mac interface <coughs> is in effect from Don Norman's work. And so the idea was about an affordance. And so um, what is an affordance? Let's start with the example. An affordance is a doorknob on a door. What does a doorknob afford you the ability to do? A doorknob affords you the ability to pull on the door. If you have a door that swings both ways, putting a doorknob on that door is going to confuse people because you know it's got a flat plate on it. Then you push, you know, you've got to push through it. The door goes both ways. But if you do not have a doorknob on a door that's supposed to pull open, it's like you're missing something. Now, do you have to use the affordance? Well, you don't always have to use the affordance. So you know, on a Mac interface. Are there other ways to delete besides using the trash can? Well, you push the delete button. Select, hit the delete button, it should work, right? That's a logical sort of thing. You don't have to use the trash can. So it doesn't force you to work in a particular way, but it allows you to do something. So when you're looking for a term that's kind of like feature or function, um, affordance is an interesting way to look at design because you're enabling a different way of working with people. Now, the Here's where the confusion comes in, and Don Norman took years to rise this. So the, originally this came up in the design of everyday things, the psychology of everyday things when he wrote this book. People, when they're thinking of doing web development work, they think the affordance is a trash can. The affordance is not the trash can. The affordance is the interaction between the person and the trash can. If the person sees a trash can on the screen, and doesn't recognize that it's for deleting stuff, that's not an affordance. If a person sees a doorknob on a door and doesn't recognize it's for pulling, it's not an affordance. So this is a really subtle shift in the way you look at systems. It's about, in this case, the interaction you have within a system. It's not about the thing itself. Yes? Would that be similar to sort of the idea of like choice architecture? So like the idea of building an environment in which, in which people, that enables people to make certain choices or better choices, would it be? Yeah, so you're using a great term. You are building an environment. You are not building the system, you are building the environment, yes. And again, so you start talking about designing. Are you designing it or are you architecting it? Because if you're architecting it, it's there and people may or may not use it. If you're designing it, you're now into saying, okay, this is the design, and you know, how are we actually going to make this door knob? Is we square, shape, whatever? No. So um, there are many things uh, coming. So affordances was developed by J.J. Um, uh, Gibson, and there's many readings for it. Uh, the term affordance refers to whatever it is about the environment that contributes to the kind of interaction that occurs. And there's more definition after that. But the idea of environment, it comes out. So we are still in systems. There is a system and environment, but you're not focused on them as separate things. You're focused on the interaction between the system and the environment. Now, if we go back to the service system example, we could talk about this in terms of high, uh, high ability and low ability. Um, so you can have the same service, but it's configured with different affordances or different people. So let's talk about um, um, health services, okay? So, so you can go in and there could be inpatient, there's outpatient, there's telehealth. Okay, so you actually don't even have to go to a hospital. You want to talk to a nurse, you pick up the phone. That is an affordance. Is the affordance of telehealth essential to a medical system? 
Well, no, people can go and go light up at a hospital or you know whatever. Uh, that it clogs up your uh, clogs up your system. So, can we design extra affordances so that people can use them or not use them? So, telehealth is an affordance. Is is it essential? That's a judgment call. You have high building people and you have low building people. So what does it mean for telehealth when the person that is going to call in doesn't speak English in their first language? Okay, is that an opportunity or is that a downside? Because on the one side, it's kind of like, okay, now they've got a problem communicating. But the upside is telehealth could actually have multiple language support. And that'd be actually a better affordance than going to a hospital where it's like, does anyone speak Pakistani? It's like, oh God, you know, how are we going to do this? So it, you can actually design affordances in a different way. You, and you can design it for a low ability person and a high ability person in different ways. So, you know, there's nothing worse, there, there's no worse patient than a doctor, right? Having a doctor come into an emergency room, that's a high ability, per, high, high ability person who's not going to be saying, don't do this, don't do that. Stop telling us what to do. You're not the doctor, you're the patient, right? As opposed to someone who can't come in and comes in and can't articulate, well, it feels sore. Well, what do you mean by feeling sore? Right. So there's different levels of building and how you design those services. Okay, now we're going to start wandering in. Um, on, on my website, um, there's this paper. This is the one from October, Pattern Language, uh, Pattern Man of Services and Thinking. This is when I actually switched over and said, okay, Christopher Alexander. Uh, I want to focus on affordances, not on the buildings. Yes. Can I, can I ask you to just go back? Go back. Sorry, okay. I know you're yep. Could you just talk about that service system box? So, like, I understand the difference between your beneficiaries being various abilities of interacting with the affordance, mm -hmm. but in that service system column. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's one system. Yeah. So, can you just talk a little bit about the difference between? input versus output for low and high? Like, what does that really mean? Okay, so for a, um, okay, let's go back to the banking example. So if you want money to come out of the bank, a low ability person has to go see a talent, okay. right? A high ability person can contribute to the co-production by punching in on the ATM. Okay. Right? Um, so I've had the interesting thing. So uh, in October, I was here with um, uh, Susu Nosala. Um, and she's, she's now in Shanghai. And so it's like getting money out of China is a real problem. It turns out that when you actually take your bank card and you put it into the machine here, you can actually take money out of Chinese bank accounts. And so Susan is now going to start routing through Toronto just to get money out of China, which is pretty funny. But what happens when you put the, money, you put the card in the machine? It comes up and the interface is Chinese. She's like Australian Finn. This is not going to work. So we've now taken something that was supposed to be a high ability, high, high ability affordance, which was ATM. What do we do? We went into the branch. It's like, could you, is there anyone in the branch who can read Chinese? And we pulled one of the tellers because the teller can't do the transaction either. The teller actually would require you to put stuff in, like so. So it's like, no. So the teller comes out down to the ATM and helps you to get money out of the machine. It's the same service system. They did not build the affordance in China that when you try to take money out of a Canadian ATM that you could actually do English. It's the same service system. So, what we, so the, if the banking system worked well, the low ability person would normally just go into the teller and tell, tell them, you know, here's my cash, here's my, um, ATM, here's my ATM card, can you give me money? You can't do that in Canada. That's a beautiful low ability sort of thing, I'm going to a teller. And the system would totally fail. But it's all one service system. It's a banking system to withdraw money. Okay, and it's, it's like the underlying assumption that you want your uh, beneficiaries of the service system to have more autonomy? Because it sounds like. It you have to like design for like all abilities. Okay. You have to design it. So, so you now hit upon one of the key ideas and the differences between a production system and a service system. So a production system, um, uh, Steve Heckel, the adaptive enterprise, talks about taxi cabs and buses. So a bus is a production system. A bus operates on the same route, it runs on a schedule, um, and it runs by that clock. It doesn't matter whether there are people who are on the bus or not on the bus. 
A taxi is a city system because when you get into the taxi, the first thing is they ask where do you want to go, which is input from the client. And you can say, uh, so I came across, yeah, actually yesterday morning I came across and we saw on city posts like the streetcars were lined up across Queen Street. Don't go on Queen Street, go on Richmond. Yeah, but Queen Street's faster. No, no, go on Richmond. So the customer now has input into what the what they'll use the tools for. No? Okay. So um, I moved over. I'm moving over to um, talking about this paper, which is what I'm building up to all this time. Um, and um, essentially, the idea of pattern language has been that you design structures. So they are designing the doorknobs. And what I'm saying is, let's design the service system. And I want to use pattern language, but I can't use the pattern language the way Christopher Alexander intended it. I don't want, don't want to do doorknobs. I want to do the interaction between the person and the doorknob. So I have to make adjustments to the way pattern language is done. Now this is from the 1968 um, book that Alexander first created. And this was a pattern language for multi-service centers. A multi-service center in 1968 uh, it was a new program in the United States where they have drug users, they have poverty, um, and this, uh, the idea was, let's take all the services and put them in one physical place. So mental services, um, physical doctors, uh, you know, all these sort of things, let's put them all in one place. You know, you know, getting your license, losing IDs, put them in one place. So the, the one that I studied was actually in Bronx, New York. And what happens is you end up with a pattern language, and you see there's this cascade of patterns. So patterns depend on it, on things, and the, and the general idea is great because you have the idea of context. So a pattern language for a, uh, a multi-service center that is done in the busy urban area is different from one that's done in the suburban area. In an urban area, you want to build where there's transportation hubs, if people are going to be coming in or walking in, it's really dense. If you're a little bit farther out, you need parking spaces. You do not need parking spaces in an urban area, and actually they're going to work against you because of the forces you have to run some space and stuff. So, why do you want to use pattern language? There's three types of help. Firstly, it gives you uh, full respect for the unique features of each special building. A pattern language is not something that you just come and say, I'm going to apply this pattern language. There's 253 patterns in a pattern language. It took them 10 years to write the book. And they all interconnect. And what happens is people say, I need a balcony. I need an alcove, uh, light on two sides of the room. That's what's most important to me. Yeah, I understand it's all those stuff, but you know, that's not really what it's all about. So you focus on specific patterns. It tells them which patterns to consider first and which ones to consider later. So there's this ordering in the shearing layer, pacing layer sort of way. You have to get the site right before you start working about the furniture. We're with furniture, but later. We, do, we need the structure, low bearing walls. It tells them which patterns go together so he knows which one to think about at the same time, which ones are done separately. So when you're focused on big things, like you're still trying to get the site and structure in, it's like, guy comes in and talks about plumbing, not ready for you, come back tomorrow. Right? That's the, the reason I like the general approach of pattern language. Now, the question that you ask about, um, about uh, the who is the thing that's missing in pattern language. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide because this one blows it up. Um, this kind of traces through the paper. Uh, but what I want to talk about is adjusting the way that we do pattern language. The pattern language was a solution to a problem in context. Pattern language is a solution to a problem in context. That's Chris Brown Dander wrote. I want to change that, and I want to change it to bring in affordances. So here's the format that we're going to have. Um, and this example is from the multi-service center. So uh, in the paper and in Chris Brown Dander's work, if you have a, uh, a multi-service center, you need a place for the kids because, because a, um, a mother who's a drug user is going to come in and she has kids. Someone has to look after the kids while she's getting her psychiatric exam or whatever, right? So someone has to look after the kids. So he actually has built into the pattern language you know, a place to look after kids. But that's like saying, I need a doorknob. I don't want the doorknob, I want the interaction. How else do we change the interaction? So let's change the pattern label to something called like minding children. And it's an active sort of thing. Minding children is an ongoing sort of thing. It's not a state. It's not a, um, uh, a coming in and going. 
And let's start off firstly with the voices on the issue. Um, this is related to some of the some of issues, basically. Uh, on, um, when you, have you ever looked at problems yet? Wait, did, have you not buy this issue-based information system? Okay, you're missing the best part of a wicked problem. <laughs> it's not even in this lecture anymore. I took that one out. So, um, and, and this will be the history of science. So, so at Berkeley, when wicked problems are being created by Horst Riddle, across the campus at Berkeley is Christopher Alexander doing pattern language. And the other person on campus is Wes Churchman, who was Russ Acoff's PhD supervisor. The three of them met the students, the grad students that you meet there, they went to all three seminars. There are different approaches now. So Horst Riddle came up with issue-based information systems. Issue-based information systems are a rationalization of looking at the way of things, which is to say, um, we take an issue and we break it down, you end up with pros and cons, and you end up in what are now called argumentation schemes. The argumentation schemes say, you know, we would uh, build this multi-service center because of this, and you end up with a tree structure. But the tree structure is not the same as what Chris Brown Alexander does. And our, the, uh, the wicked problems approach is a top-down approach that tries to decompose a problem. But it, uh, first thing is the word problem, which is good. Um, it's systems, and this comes to the West Churchman side, uh, and Russ Acoff. Um, Russ Acoff would say that we don't look at problems, we look at systems of problems. A problematique. And Russ Acoff calls that a mess. So you start off with this mess, this problem as heat. If you have a system of problems, you need a system of solutions. Which is good for systems people, but then you get over to Mr. Alexander's camp who says, a uh, pattern is a solution to a problem in context. Okay, what do you mean by problem? And then you take the word problem over to Horst Riddle in Wicked Problems, and he goes, well, let's we'll use the word issues. Because issue can be decomposed into problems. And so that's kind of all the background that goes into this. So when I say you have a voice on an issue, you've got a who and a what. So what's the issue here? What's the issue about minding kids? So for a client coming in, there's this issue. What services are available for me now and on appointment? So um, because I need to come in, uh, maybe I can come in like after hours, someone else goes after my kids, and you guys don't have to worry about it. Or you, know, uh, or you guys provide childcare services? Like those sort of things you worry about. Yes? I was just wondering if we could just Take a pause for a moment. Sure. I'm, I'm a little bit lost in terms of what this relates to. Um, what this all, what this relates to. Okay. Yeah. I so, just, I just okay. Good. Good. Okay. So there is. So since 1968, there's all this work on architecture and pattern language, okay. which people have actually forgotten what they shouldn't have because you go to an architect and you talk about pattern language, they should use. In the 1980s, in computer science, there's all this work about pattern language. And it's good in some respects because when you're designing software, you are building structures that are somewhat permanent. And so you'd say, well, and in a private architect, you always get the analogy, should you build a, uh, you know, you always get the analogy, should you build a software system like a house? We always talk about that. Um, there, there was this discussion, um, Brady Booth says you should actually design software like a river and, and think about it that way. And already trying to go, well, maybe the idea of buildings doesn't really apply to software. When you get all the way over to services, it's like, okay, now it's like you have all these interactions. I've been talking about doorknobs, you know. If people come in and say, I'm going to design the doorknob, I'm saying you're missing the whole point of services. We're not talking about a production system, which is how do I build all these doorknobs? I don't care about the doorknobs. I care about the interaction. Right. So it could be, right? The interaction as the The interaction between the, the actor and the thing. Yeah. So, so a service is now a thing. An offering is a thing. Right? But it's not a thing in the sense that people normally think about because when you are a, a, in a service system, the customer is inside the system. When you're designing a system, there's always this question, do you put the customer inside the system or outside the system? 
system thinking is the most boundary is the, is, the, is the first thing. In a production system, you can put the customer outside the system. The bus runs whether there are passengers on it or not. When you change to being a service system, all of a sudden the interactions come in and we say, well, okay, I don't care about this. We're going to run this taxi like a bus system. And you go, you're missing the point. Okay? Clear? Okay, so I have to adjust the pattern language. And, and so this is something that's taken actually three years. So this is why I had to go to the computer science conference, I had to go to the social change conference, I had to go to the architecture conference, because Christopher Alexander, like, I can't, people, the worst thing about, and I work in communities of practice and understand knowledge management, the worst thing about coming into a community is someone says, you obviously haven't read the literature and you don't know what I'm talking about. And what's happened is because I've now actually gone back, and it's interesting, three years, I went to the architecture conference, and um, there's actually, uh, I put the YouTube video in, so I did the whole presentation in 20 minutes, something I had. At the end of the presentation, you hear, I ask any questions, and you hear, wow. The wow came from Max Jacobson. Max Jacobson was one of the authors of a pattern language with Mr. Alexander. I got to talk and experience with them and say, okay, and so he said, what was it like writing right pattern language? He said, they have this rule, 253 patterns, 10 years to write them. In the pattern language, they have um, asterisks beyond, beside every pattern. Three asterisks means it's a real pattern. One asterisk means we think it's a pattern, but we're actually not sure. And he said that they were sitting and they all go to funk. They have, uh, you have all these authors sitting in a room and they're going, is it a pattern or not pattern? Is it making the book? Is not making the book? They said, you know, deep funk, everybody goes, ah. <laughs> You know, we have to agree it goes in the book, but we have to disagree that it doesn't go in the book, right? If it, if we don't all agree it doesn't go in the book. The pattern language is written in a book, but it shouldn't have been written as a book. It should have been written as a wish. <laughs> More history of science. So, when the pattern language in software development was created, the Design Patterns book, Ward Cunningham was a member of that community and he invented the wiki. Why did he invent the wiki? It's because they were trying to write patterns, but all the patterns are connected to other patterns. And so he invented the wiki as a way of doing that. Now the whole other story about, about uh, Ward Cunningham working on federated wiki, I'm working on that, but there's all these linkages about patterns, design, architecture, all the stuff that goes in the history that people have forgotten because you end up being disciplinary. When you go in system thinking, you go, okay, let's understand all of them. Got to put them all together. Wow, I'm so far behind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so minding children. So the first thing is, let's, let's focus on the voices on the issues. We need to know the who, because when you talk about pattern language, Christopher Alexander has a discussion about quality. And this is one thing, in the first book it was called Quality Without a Name. And eventually, like within 25 years, eventually he called it living. And what's the guy trying to do? He's saying, well, there's a space we like. There's a quality in the space that we like. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's a living space. And you end up with these sort of arm waving sort of thing. Well, what is it that you're trying to do here? And when you're doing that built environment, that's because he treats everyone the same. Christopher Alexander has this thing, you have uh, the carpet experiment. He has a whole book on Turkish carpets. And in effect, the question is, there are two carpets here, there's a one on the left and there's a one on the right. Which do people prefer? And it, it turns out that almost everyone prefers a carpet on the left. And so what are the, who are the people that prefer the carpet on the right? Apparently only computer science people like the carpet on the right, they don't know why. And so they do this aberration. But it's like, Christopher Alexander, if you build a great space it is the same great space for everyone. In a service system, that's not what it's all about. A service system has the person in the system. Going to a restaurant is a really interesting experience for me because I come from a restaurant family. I like cooking at home. So when I go for a restaurant, I want to have stuff that I don't do at home. So it's like when I go to the restaurant, the first thing is, is there any fish on the menu? Because I normally don't cook fish at home, right? So that's not how most people think. But when we're going through the interaction, it's like if, if we're talking about restaurants, I want to make sure that I at least have an option of choosing fish. 
So start with a voice on the issues. What is the issue they're concerned with? Um, so for a parent, what can I do with my kids when I'm busy? For a child, the child is also a voice on the issue. The child also has concern because what can I do I want to play? So the affording value, how do you describe the affording value? Leaving a child at a supervised play area so their whereabouts are known, availing distractions for toddlers, through teens, so they come into the parents less of a chore. Yes, spatial temporal frames. Now this is part of the context, and this is where this thing gets really subtle, is that I place the context in three ways. There's firstly the spatial temporal context of where and when, uh, and you don't have to think about when or where in the idea of affordance. Because it could exist, the doorknob is there, but I don't see it. The when and where means that they see it. So there's this interaction. The affordance is that facilities and programs are known to children and parents in advance of appointments. If I didn't know there was child care in the multi-service center, then you know, I would have made other arrangements. You get there and go, oh, I didn't have to do that. I could just have my kids here. I didn't have to you know, go through all this babysitting routine. And, you know. Then you've got two ideas. So you've read the article on Hanarchy, right? Yes, not. It was assigned to you a couple weeks ago. So in Panarchy, there's an idea, and I'll come back to it in a little bit, uh, of contained systems. Contained systems are slower and larger, and there are contained systems that are smaller and faster. And so we have to think about the systems and how they operate. Uh, I will come back to that um, in a minute. And I don't have time to uh, do this. Um, on the next page, if you decide to do a pattern language approach, here is the prescription for doing the pattern language approach. And it's in the research paper as well. But I have, like, you actually try to not use verbs, you try to use verbs rather than nouns, and you try to structure things. So um, I need to move on because um, I have a little more explaining for you before you get ready for this stuff. So, David, do you want to uh, I don't want to cut you short, but these guys are probably getting to the point where they're about to overflow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say maybe we should take a break. I'm going to give you a little bit of time after the break. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Does that work for you guys? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.